and to tell us more about the significance of the James Fest Distinguished Lecture Series. May we now invite our Dean, Professor Joseph Song, NTU Singapore's Distinguished University Professor and Senior Vice President for Health and Life Sciences to give his opening address. Professor Song, please. First of all, let me once again welcome James and Doris Best. Come back to NTU. Shall we give them a big round of applause? Yeah. Mr. Lee Trampo, Chairman of the Governing Board. Mr. Joe Sim, Group CEO of NHG. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome today to uh, the James Best Lecture. Always the best lecture. <laughs> Well, in 2022, uh, Lee Chen inaugurated this uh, lecture as part of our 10th anniversary distinguished visiting uh, professorship and made possible by a generation uh, of uh, half a million from a very generous donor. This series of lectures features distinguished professor renowned as global leader in their respective fields. Through this platform, LKC Medicine play a crucial role in convening leading thinkers and industrial partners to dive into um, compelling topics in medicine and beyond, fostering dialogues and advancing discourses on the evolution of medicine, medical education, and research. In the past three edition of the James Best Distinguished Lecture, we were privileged to have host of course, Professor James Best himself, Professor Dame Sally Davis, uh, who was the 40th Master of uh, Trinity College, Cambridge, and also the first woman to hold that position, Professor Barry Marshall, a Nobel laureate from the University of Western Australia, a physician and receiving a Nobel Prize uh, back in 1995, uh, uh, to be our distinguished lecturer. They covered the topics including preserving the art and furthering the science of medicine, life lessons from a biotech entrepreneur, and improving life through sciences. Their contributions through uh, these talks have played a crucial role in shaping the landscape of medicine by educating future healthcare professionals, advocating for policy changes, and fostering collaborations. In this regard, Today's distinguished lecture with Professor Swami Nathan will touch upon a very, yet another very important and urgent topic, namely climate change, public health, and equity. The impacts of climate change on health are multifaceted and include increased heat related illness, vector borne diseases, respiratory issues from air pollution, food and water insecurity mental health effects due to extreme weather events and displacement. In fact, um, a year ago, I don't even realize that um, climate change can have so many different aspects uh, infecting, affecting our, our health, from physical to mental. As we witness the escalating effect of climate change worldwide, it becomes increasingly evident that this repercussions extend far beyond environmental concerns, sipping into every fiber of human health and well-being. The intertwined relationship between climate change and human health uh, demands urgent attention and concerted efforts in both local and global levels. However, progress has been uneven to effectively address the interconnected issues of climate change public health and equity. In Singapore, the Climate Impact Science Research Program has looked at how climate change affects the transmission of the infectious disease. But there are many other aspects that we need to deal with. A recent systemic, systematic review study examining climate variability and air quality with population health in Singapore has also found several effects of climate change as such absolute humidity, ring 4, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and they are positively um, influencing our pulmonary and cardiovascular health. At the national level, these are concerning for Singapore and what it means for our local health system. So I, I think I can see from the attendance of this uh, lecture today 
that this is really a problem that um, a lot of people are very concerned and we feel the urgency of doing something. So no person is better than our distinguished lecturer tonight, uh, Professor Sonia Swaminathan, to address uh, this problem. I'll leave it to James to uh, read her citation. In today's lecture, we shall explore the intricate relationship between climate change and health, examining its multifaceted impact, and discuss potential strategies for mitigation and adaptation. With Professor Swami Layden leading uh, this discourse, I'm sure we will gain some fruitful insight. In the past two days, I have the <coughs> great honor of having two meals with her and uh, sharing a lot of her wisdom and insight from the world um, from the uh, WHO uh, in this area. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome all of you to attend this evening's uh, lecture and very warm welcome to Professor Swami Nathan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Song. I'd now like to invite Professor James Best to read a citation for our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Salmia Swaminathan. Professor Best, please. Good evening, everyone. LKC Medicine Chairman and Dean, NHG Group CEO, friends and colleagues, I'm delighted to be back in Singapore and honoured to attend this event once again. And it's, of course, truly a great pleasure to introduce the speaker for this evening's distinguished lecture, Professor Sumya Swaminathan. Professor Swaminathan is a renowned scientist in the field of global health and infectious diseases with a distinguished career marked by groundbreaking research and impactful leadership. She was very recently the Chief Scientist at the World Health Organization and before that WHO Deputy Director General for Programs. In these positions she played a pivotal role in shaping international health policies and strategies, particularly in the fight against infectious diseases such as TB, TB HIV, and of course, COVID-19. During the pandemic, she played a key role in coordinating scientific efforts at the WHO, urging countries to conduct whole genome sequencing of the SARS COVID to virus more frequently, and setting up COVAX with a focus on equitable vaccine distribution to lower and middle income countries. A visionary leader, Professor Swaminathan has made significant contributions to advancing public health initiatives worldwide. Her expertise spans multiple domains, including epidemiology, microbiology, and clinical medicine making her a leading authority in several fields. She has championed initiatives to improve access to healthcare services, promote health equity and enhance disease surveillance and response systems. A pediatrician from India, Professor Swaminathan was also Secretary to the Government of India for Health Research and Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research from 2015 to 17. Over the years, she's published more than 450 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters, and is a fellow of the US National Academy of Medicine, the Academy of Medical Sciences of the UK, and a fellow of all science academies in India. Currently serving as chairperson at the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, which was started by her late father. Professor Swaminathan aims to accelerate the use of science and technology for agricultural and rural development to improve the lives and livelihoods of communities. Professor Swaminathan, we are privileged to have you with us today to deliver this distinguished lecture on climate change, public health and equity. As our Dean mentioned, Nobody could be better qualified to address this topic, and we all look forward 
for the insights and wisdom you've been sharing with us. I'm honoured to present, present our speaker for this evening, Professor Sumya Swaminathan. Now welcome on stage our guest speaker, uh, Professor so Somia Swaminathan, to deliver her much anticipated lecture on climate change, public health and equity. Professor, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dean of the LKC School of Medicine and also the Chair of the Board. Um, Dr. James Best, after whom this lecture is named, a distinguished um, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. First of all, let me thank Professor Joseph Sung for uh, having invited me and uh, considering me uh, worthy enough to give this very distinguished lecture. We heard the previous speakers who have delivered this, and also for welcoming me so warmly to Singapore. And I've had a marvelous two days here interacting with uh, different uh, groups, uh, both in the NTU as well as outside. And, um, and also thank you, uh, Professor Best, for this very kind uh, introduction that uh, I'm sure I, I don't deserve at all. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, as uh, Professor Best uh, mentioned, I'm a pediatrician by training. I haven't trained in climate science or anything like that. But having spent a career both in medical research, in public health, as head of the Indian Council of Medical Research, also at the policy making level in India, and then moving to the WHO and seeing, uh, really looking, getting a global perspective. Um, of course, a lot of that was during the pandemic. So it was very colored by everything that happened during COVID, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But, um, this is what actually convinced me even more that what's really going to impact our health today is not what is happening in hospitals and health centers, but really what is happening upstream. And uh, the determinants of our health and the risk factors for our health that we pay too little attention to. Climate change, of course, is one of these um, absolutely uh, critical and uh, uh, it's an issue that, you know, is uh, actually threatens the very future of humanity, even though we don't think about it that way. And I think it's because we've all uh, seen these documentaries um, on television which show, you know, these poor polar bears stuck on you know, small little ice floats uh, in the Arctic uh, and so on. And so we thought about climate change as having an impact somewhere on some animals far away. But in reality, it's been creeping up. And today, we're at the point, literally, of having a very, very narrow window of opportunity to turn the tide. And otherwise, I mean, collectively, I think as a human race, it is uh, going to be very difficult uh, to survive. And we've, of course, had all our world leaders uh, warn us about this. And uh, Mr. Guterres, the Secretary General, has been using you know, stronger and stronger language. He, you know, he talks about how. It's, we're not in an era of global warming, but global boiling, and we're sleepwalking, you know, to climate catastrophe and things like that. Uh, there is enough data, of course. You know, we have the IPCC reports. We've had six IPCCs come out, and it's been very clear from the first report that human activity has led to climate change. Now, the strange thing is that we've had 28 COPs, and it was only at the last COP in Dubai that health was on the agenda despite the fact that you know, it has such a huge impact on health, the WHO has been championing this for many years, but it was for the first time in, in uh, November 23, and this is where you know, Tedros, Dr. Tedros made these uh, remarks and, and said health has to be a prominent feature of the climate agenda from now on, because uh, clearly people are already being impacted. Their health is already being impacted. Now, you know, the World Economic Forum comes out with the Global Risks Report. Uh, I, I believe it's every two years. And they look at uh, the impact of various risks globally over a two-year and a ten-year period. And you can see that, you know, everything that's in green color 
is an environmental uh, risk and what you have in blue is economic and the red is societal and then there's also purple that's the technological the cyber uh, crime and ai and things like that but if you look at two years there's a fair amount of green there but if you look at the 10-year risks um, and clearly they're looking at the impact on the economy you'll find that six out of the ten are related to nature and environment and to climate change so i think there is no disagreement that this is uh, and these are just some images that we've all seen you know over the last particularly 2023 which has been i think the worst year on record in terms of heat but also in terms of major disasters all around the world whether it's flooding cyclones um, extreme heat uh, including in europe the, the wildfires in canada that impacted all of north america with smoke pollution we had the terrible fire in hawaii you know after 100 years where um, they lost the whole town and many people died and uh, the horn of africa has been having consecutive seasons of drought uh, and and flood and that's terrible because uh, that really means that the land is then fit uh, for nothing so we're already seeing things like you know not being able to grow crops and that leads to of course uh, food insecurity migration and so on in india as well just in uh, the nine months between january and september on 86 percent of the days india actually experienced a weather event an extreme weather event in one part of the country or the other and the number of lives claimed is not insignificant and you can see a, you know huge amount of land uh, crop area that was damaged houses of course uh, and animals huge toll on on animals because with time the disaster response has got better and better and so in fact the loss of human lives has been minimized despite having some very severe events but unfortunately animals cannot also be always saved you know at the same time so this obviously then impacts those families that depend on agriculture and uh, on livestock so how does climate change actually impact our health and it's through many many pathways both direct and indirect and on the direct side of course we can imagine that you know, temperature extremes both heat and cold rising sea level and i think singapore being an island is very acutely conscious of this fact as are many of the small island developing states where it's really a matter of existence um, if the, the, uh, the predictions of the one meter rise in sea level by 2100 come true then many of the low-lying islands really will uh, may not even exist then we have floods droughts windstorms wildfires and of course air pollution that we'll talk more about and then there are many indirect effects as we mentioned displacements that happen because the livelihoods are uh, no longer sustaining people health systems get weakened you know we've seen uh, health facilities being destroyed uh, of course healthcare workers themselves are people that they are affected as well by these impacts impacts on food and water systems and then professor song mentioned the infectious and vector borne diseases we know that dengue for example is fastest spreading vector borne disease today globally that malaria is now in places which it could not uh, the mosquito anopheles could not survive before and then just like the pandemic we we will see a worsening or an exacerbation of the social determinants and inequalities and what we saw during covid was that it did not create these inequalities right it only made them very obvious and you could see who in every society who were the people who were the most vulnerable the marginalized the one with the least amount of resources and resilience and it happened in every country i don't think there's a single country where one part of the population was not uh, more disproportionately impacted than the other so this is what climate change is also doing so this uh, schematic basically uh, tries to link you know what the ecological determinants of health are uh, at, at the bottom you can see the extreme weather the habitat and biodiversity loss uh, soil loss water shortage temperature rise sea level rise etc and then how that impacts the social and structural determinant, uh, determinants of health you know housing supply chain disruptions education disruptions and then health systems themselves of course are impacted as we just said and this then leads to all the other impacts uh, to people that we just talked about 
Um, there's there's a, an agency that does uh, global climate risk uh, index rating, and you can see the country I live in, India, of course, is very badly uh, at risk, but also is a large part of Asia, uh, Sub Saharan Africa, and Latin America. There's a Lancet countdown that comes up every year with uh, we're tracking many indicators related to climate and health. And the report last year, uh, just a few of the facts there were that heat-related deaths of people older than 65 years have increased significantly, 85%. That the cities that were surveyed, at least a quarter of them, were concerned their health systems were going to be overwhelmed. And labor loss, I think industry um, doesn't fully get the fact that there's going to be a huge amount of productivity loss because of heat, for example, in the tropical countries. Temperatures already last year was the first time that we hit the 1.5 degrees. As you know, the IPCC had given the 1.5 degrees as you know sort of the upper limit beyond which the impacts on humans will be very unpredictable and will be very dire. But we already hit that 1.5 last year. Of course, it doesn't mean that we've crossed that. We have to sustain it for, for uh, several years before we can, but it's indicating to us that we might be at the point where we're crossing the 1.5 that countries had agreed in 2015 in Paris that they would do everything possible to not cross the 1.5, right? And we're already there. Now we're looking at can we stay below two degrees warming? And if we rise to two degrees, then these are all the things that would, ha would happen. Heat-related deaths, you know, increasing quite a bit, heat-related labor loss, uh, lots of people experiencing, 500 million additional people experiencing food insecurity. We know after COVID that food insecurity actually has gone up for the first time uh, in, in many years. And then diseases like dengue will also be impacted. Now you can see on this graph uh, how you know heat uh, has been going up. The change in global surface temperature just over the last few decades has been so dramatic. Um, now, many countries don't have good data uh, on uh, cause of death. And therefore, if you start looking for data on death due to heat or death due to air pollution, you will not find that data in many country uh, records, death records. And so we really uh, then don't know how many deaths we can attribute it to heat. But you can get an idea by looking at things like all cause mortality. If you look at the whole year and you see a pattern every year emerging, you know, all-cause mortality going up, let's say, on the weeks when the temperatures were very hot in that region, we could start to make some associations. But ultimately, we need, you know, better depth recording. The same problem happened during COVID. WHO was really struggling to ascribe deaths to COVID because firstly, there wasn't a lot of testing going on in many countries. And secondly, the death records, uh, you know, don't ascribe the cause of death. So it was post-mortem studies and things in Africa that actually showed us and then, of course, the zero surveys that were done in Africa, because everyone believed in the beginning that Africa was spared, that uh, you know, they were not affected by COVID. The fact is that serological surveys showed that almost 80-90% of the population actually had antibodies. So everybody had been exposed. They had lower deaths because um, they had much younger population, the median age being 18 years, but they also uh, you know, did not record the, the, the deaths. So we, we know that uh, weather predictions have improved dramatically in the last few decades. And now we get very accurate uh, weather predictions for a few days uh, or even weeks in advance. And therefore, we need to start using these to take action you know, on the ground, to warn people, to give advice, to prepare health systems. Now, it may, it may be difficult to read the schematic, but again, heat impacts all parts of the body. And basically, what it does is it causes vasodilatation uh, of the blood vessels. So you start uh, perspiring and losing to cool the body. And then that leads to dehydration. The heart is pumping much faster. Uh, the blood pressure is dropping because the blood vessels are dilating. And this then leads to, uh, if it continues and you don't cool the body down, then it leads to a lot of problems. Uh, in the, and you can, of course, get heat stroke and heat exhaustion. And you can uh, die, uh, basically, of uh, dehydration and the systemic collapse. But what is less well studied is the impact of maybe chronic heat or um, somebody being exposed to um, what, what's called high wet bulb temperatures when the night temperature goes up as well and there's high humidity. Uh, 
you know, I live in Chennai, which is also a city with very high humidity like Singapore. And so being exposed to heat plus humidity continuously day and night without the body having a chance to recover uh, probably means that the cardiovascular system is under very high stress. And, uh, you know, those kind of uh, research studies have not been done in uh, the tropics or in low and middle income countries. Now, there are innovative solutions. For example, this group of women in Jodhpur, which is in Rajasthan, which is, as you know, a desert state in India, the Mahila Housing Trust, they train women as climate-resilient experts. And they're doing water management. But they're also, you can see, um, coating the, the roofs of these houses with solar reflective paint, and particularly in low-income houses. And it, it's very beneficial, especially for the women and young children who are uh, indoors. Similarly, in Ahmedabad, there was a heat wave in uh, 2010, which uh, accounted for 1,300 deaths just in those two weeks. And since then, they put in a plan, a heat action plan, and they're down to zero deaths, basically, and they do track deaths due to heat. So they have color-coded systems, you know, to yellow, orange, and red. And then everybody knows what to do on a yellow day. You know, schools, hospitals, professional groups are informing people what to do. Transport officials are installing fans and shades, distributing drinking water. And then on a red day, even things like temples, public buildings, malls are turned into cooling centers, you know, where people can come and cool down with air conditioned place with, uh, with water. Hospitals set up extra wards uh, with staff who are trained how to you know, diagnose and treat heat strokes. And outdoor workers have to shift their working hours. So engaging health workers, community leaders, radio hosts, sending all these messages through various uh, modalities. And then, of course, having training women on how to protect themselves and, and their children. So, so these are some of the images uh, as to what Ahmedabad actually does during the heat. And more and more, I think, cities are going to have to do these kind of uh, take actions. Of course, having blue-green spaces in cities, and Singapore is a, a great example of having so much of greenery, uh, really helps to cool the temperatures, but unfortunately, many cities you know, are not like that. So I think heat is going to be a huge problem for us in this part of the world, as well as in sub-Saharan Africa. And we need much more research to understand what happens, how it happens. But also, I think we need immediate action on mitigation uh, and on helping communities and families cope with the heat, particularly, again, those who are poor and don't have access you know, to fans or air conditioners. Now, air pollution is, uh, is, is a huge public health emergency as well. And in fact, I uh, discussed with my WHO colleagues why WHO cannot uh, call this a public health emergency. Because as you know, it's only infectious diseases so far that have been called a public health emergency, according to the international health regulations. But actually, it kills more people than HIV, TB, and malaria combined, um, uh, accounting for about 7 to 8 million deaths uh, every year if you add up you know, outdoor, that's ambient and household air pollution. There are also uh, estimates from the World Bank on the health damage, running into trillions. The OECD says 1.2 billion workdays are lost because people are getting sick or their children are sick. And I know, for example, in North India, it's really bad in the winter. Schools have to close down, you know, <coughs> people have to take off from work. It also impacts agriculture, it produces uh, crop, uh, global yields of crops, and um, a big problem, of course, still is uh, access to clean fuels. And in many parts of Asia and Africa, women are still collecting uh, firewood and using biomass for cooking and heating purposes. And this, again, is something that disproportionately impacts women. And despite all of this, very little global finance has been committed to targeting air pollution. Now, of course, fossil fuels are the, the culprit for both air pollution and climate change. So if you address fossil fuels, both of these should improve. Now, this figure in the middle basically shows you the global distribution of the PM2.5 monitoring stations. And you can see that you know, the monitoring stations are concentrated only in some parts of the world. And there are other parts of the world where we don't even know. Uh, and so it's similar to COVID testing. You know, The whole of Africa, there's, there's hardly any monitoring. But we know that they're exposed to very high PM2.5. You can see there, you know, the entire sub-Himalayan belt, the Indian subcontinent, is impacted particularly in the winter months. 
Now, the WHO standard is to have, uh, for people to breathe a PM 2.5 of less than five micrograms per cubic meter as annually uh, mean. And the report that just came out yesterday, the IQA report, basically says only 10 out of 134 countries achieve the standard. And these are all islands and small countries. You know. Australia, New Zealand fall in that group, but other countries, Finland, Estonia, you know, there are no large countries really uh, in that. So 99% of people worldwide are breathing air, which is above the WHO standards. The worst air quality is over Asia and Africa, particularly in the developing countries. We know the sources, variety of sources, factories, industry vehicles, power plants, but also fires more and more, the wildfires, and dust and other natural sources account for quite a lot in some countries. Uh, looking at data from our National Family Health Survey, we found that the PM 2.5 levels were highest in clusters with uh, high prevalence of poverty. Now, last year, um, a group of us came together and formed a group called Our Common Air. And in fact, uh, this group was formed basically to bring attention of the world's leaders to uh, this problem of air pollution and also produce uh, papers that uh, provide scientific solutions, uh, financing options to make an economic case to, uh, to tackle air pollution and to put out a call for action. So these uh, a set of papers will be out very soon in the next couple of weeks. And uh, we've had very encouraging good uh, feedback from the World Bank, for example, who has and is prioritizing air pollution uh, along with uh, climate. And so I think most of the development banks, if they all uh, pay attention to this problem, then at least you know the grants and loans that they give can be used. Uh, so of course the first step is you know you have to monitor, you have to find out what the problem is and how much it is. So as we saw the map, large parts of the world don't even have air quality monitoring stations. And you need them in both urban and rural areas. Then you know we've got to do source apportionment studies because the uh, causes of the air pollution may vary a little bit. We know the major contributors, but can vary from city to city and even from season to season. So that type of analysis is helpful to know where to intervene, where you're going to have most impact. Then, you know, this link between air pollution and illness and death, the same as between heat. Uh, we run into the same problem of air pollution. We know the risk factor not only for respiratory illnesses, but for cardiovascular, for neurological, for cognitive impairment in children, for poor educational outcomes, etc. but very hard to prove that. And so what we need to do now is to look at health outcome data, um, cancer rates, you know, cardiovascular uh, you know, and stroke rates, etc., and correlate it with, ex with exposure, with the hotspots, and identify vulnerable uh, populations, could be by age and sex, but could also be by geographic Location could be by occupation. Policemen, for example, are, uh, for example, at high risk there because they're standing in the middle of traffic all the time. And then we need uh, to, of course, prepare the health system. For example, in North India, every winter we see, you know, the hospitals being flooded with uh, cases of asthma, with uh, pneumonia, and so on. But ultimately, to, to have a solution for uh, things like air pollution and climate change as a whole, it has to be a multi-sectoral response. It's not the job or responsibility of the health ministry or the department, but the non-health sectors play a major role, whether it's you know, the road uh, people, whether it's the industries, uh, the ministry that looks out the industries, power plants, etc., transport, um, uh, as well as, of course, fuel, moving to clean fuels. Uh, and, and so the health, in health ministries, but also doctors, and I would appeal to all of you to become advocates for change across, because you have to convey the urgency of this to you know people in the community, and so that ordinary people understand and demand action uh, from their governments, but also to policymakers. And ultimately, you need a political will, and we know in city after city, country after country, that when there has been political will, it's been possible to clean up the air. Now, while we're doing mitigation, and, and like we said, fossil fuels, once we start reducing uh, the use of fossil fuels and the carbon emission from them, we are going to start seeing a good positive impact on, uh, on air pollution. 
But what do we do with people today that are exposed to all these very unhealthy levels of air? And uh, you need uh, an action plan. So every city needs to really have an action plan. If you go above a certain limit, you know, what are the things you need to do? You could wear a mask, of course. You know, there are ways to protect yourself personally. Those who can afford it, you know, they put air purifiers in their, in their houses and their rooms. But again, how many people can afford that? You know, is artificial rain. Uh, in Delhi, for example, they go uh, and spray water uh, to basically to settle the dust. And yesterday, I was uh, very privileged to visit the uh, institute here, the Tamasek Life Science Accelerator, where I saw this device that you can see uh, a picture of. It looks like an ordinary plant, an ornamental plant that you might have in your office or in your house. But actually, it's capturing these particles by emitting ions. They, they discovered a technology which uh, plants emit these negative ions. And if you can stimulate them, they emit them even more faster. And uh, I saw the uh, demonstration of how in a polluted uh, cabin, you put this plant in, and within about four or five minutes, it's actually uh, made all of those particles you know, settle down, and then you can wipe it off. And so we need this type of innovation that can, that's of course uh, efficient, but also that's affordable and that can be uh, widely used and adapted. For indoor particularly, this would be a particularly good uh, uh, solution, but perhaps even for outdoor, we could uh, think of solutions like this. So uh, we've talked about uh, pollution, we've talked about heat. The third major area that I wanted to uh, talk about a little bit, also because of the work that our foundation does, is the link between agriculture, environment, health, and, and nutrition. And of course, agriculture, again, if you look at the global uh, sources, uh, proportionately, you know, it's a large proportion, about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions actually come from agriculture and land use. And so it's both deforestation and converting forests for agriculture, but it's also the kind of agriculture that one does, the crops that you grow, how much water you use, uh, and uh, what combination of plants you have, and whether there's uh, a lot of biodiversity there or not. And so, and the use of pesticides and growth promoters. And, and of course, the big li livestock farms we know are not only uh, destroying forests uh, in, in Brazil, for example, where the rainforest is being destroyed to have cattle farms uh, so that uh, large amounts of beef can be produced and exported, basically, because the demand for animal protein has gone up so much, but it also uh, emits a lot of methane, and we know that livestock emission of methane contributes significantly to the entire uh, you know, yeah. area of agriculture contributing to greenhouse gas emission. So land, water, biodiversity, air, all of these uh, are impacted by the type of agriculture, uh, agricultural practices, these are natural resources, and this in turn, of course, impacts our environment, there's water depletion and contamination, soil depletion, degradation. There's a lot of research now showing that the nutrient content of crops in many parts of the world is going down because crops, the soil has mm. uh, lost, it's, uh, it's not healthy mm. anymore. So it's a lot of chemicals being added, uh, but that's not doing the trick anymore. So the amount of fertilizer used is going up without a corresponding increase in yields. And then of course you've got a loss of plant and animal diversity because we're growing the same crops. So globally, 70% of uh, the crops, food crops, are rice, wheat, and maize. Whereas in the past, we had something like 5,000 species of, of, of plants that we used to grow and eat. And that's all now disappearing or already disappeared. And then these, of course, have health impacts. Environmental changes would then lead to things like undernutrition, more allergies, uh, diseases, including cancer, but also endocrine diseases. We, we know that there's a lot more metabolic syndrome, PCOS, and diseases like that, which many people think are linked to the chemicals that they're exposed to. And so all of this then leads to, of course, uh, the issue of uh, uh, it's a vicious cycle. Uh, as we keep uh, degrading our environment, we need more and more chemical inputs. And uh, ultimately, it's a question of our food and nutrition security. There, there are predictions that uh, many of our crops, the yields are going to reduce or stagnate, like I said, despite increasing inputs, and therefore there'll be a price increase 
uh, as well. Now, what is also very worrying in terms of health, uh, and to those of you who deal with a lot of non-communicable diseases, is that the burden attributable to dietary risks has been consistently going up, both from males and females, uh, globally over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, both the deaths and the dallies. So dietary risks are uh, today uh, on top of the global risks to health. So if you just take diet, and air pollution, you would, you know, cover most of the risks to health of people around the world today. So again, just wanted to show some data from India from a recent survey. Of course, the survey took many, many years to do because India is a huge country, as you know. This was funded by the SCMR. And essentially what it shows is the prevalence of diabetes on the top uh, graph, map. Uh, dark red the states are the ones which have a prevalence of more than 15%, and then the yellow and the green uh, are the ones which are still low, like less than 5%. But the bottom map is pre diabetes, and as you know, pre diabetes usually will convert into diabetes unless you take some action. And therefore, you can see that huge part of North and Central India, which actually has more malnutrition and more poverty, which is why they are a little bit behind South India. South India, as you know, is considered more developed, there's more literacy, there's you know, more industrialization, people are uh, uh, earning more, and therefore they had this epidemiological transition a few decades ago, whereas the north of India is just sitting on a time bomb waiting to convert from pre-diabetes to diabetes. You can also see the bar chart showing the millions of, or the hundreds of millions of people with, for example, hypertension, 315 million people with hypertension, and only about 10 or 15% of them actually know that they have high blood pressure and are on treatment and are under control. Obesity, abdominal obesity, you can see is 350 million. And we have 100 and at that time one, but now it's 111 million people with diabetes and about 150 million with pre-diabetes. So of course the numbers in India are always very frightening because our population is, is so big. But the question is that, um, in the last three or four decades, you know, the rate of uh, the prevalence of diabetes in the population has gone up so rapidly. And so this, obviously our genetics hasn't changed. And so what has changed is the food that we're consuming, the exercise and physical activity, and some of the other risk factors like air pollution is known also to be a risk factor for diabetes. So it may not be very obvious, but all of these risks together um, are leading to a very, very dangerous situation. And as you know, diabetes and hypertension lead to a lot of complications like kidney disease and heart attacks and strokes. So we'll have to keep building more and more dialysis centers, more and more you know, cardiac surgery units. I don't think there's any limit to the burden on the health system. And this is why, again, I believe that we have to focus more on prevention and health promotion and really make uh, people able to live uh, healthier lives. Now this uh, graph is from the Atlas of Sustainable Development Goals, the World Bank, and essentially they said a healthy and nutrient adequate meal, one meal, uh, should cost about 80 cents a day. And then if you look at this graph over here, basically what it shows is as the GDP per capita reduces, 80-90% of people in those countries cannot afford a healthy meal. So in India it's something like 70%. In Tanzania, it's 90% of people. So uh, it's also a question of affordability. We, we can tell people eat a healthy meal, but can they afford it? Is it available? Is it accessible? And is it affordable? Now, are there solutions to these things? Yes. And I think we have to start looking at biodiversity climate change. Again, we've got two global uh, groups or mechanisms or platforms We've got the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, and they have their own COPs. They talk about biodiversity, they come up with their own uh, commitments and resolutions and targets and indicators. And then you've got climate change and the IPCC and the COP. Uh, they, we also have national commitments and, and so on. But I think we need to start looking at, at both of these together and linking them with human health and well-being. We know, for example, that Shifting climatic zones uh, lead to displacement of species, more frequent wildfires, 
lead to destroyed habitats. Similarly, deforestation, which is an issue on the biodiversity side, leads to decreased carbon sequestration. And similarly, land degradation leads to increased greenhouse gas emissions from the soil. The same thing in oceans. And again, we pay less attention to the oceans mm. because it's not visible before our eyes, but we know that corals are getting bleached at a tremendous rate. And uh, it's believed that you know we, there's a real good chance that corals are not going to survive uh, that the rate at which the water temperatures are rising. Um, with oxygen depletion and acidification, there's decreased biodiversity in the water. Similarly, destruction of seagrass beds leads to decreased carbon storage of mangroves, seagrasses. Uh, these are all, you know, they, it's called blue carbon because they, they do capture a lot of carbon. And then overfishing, which is again human beings, uh, obviously means that there's much less. So again, nature has its ways of protecting uh, us, and, and mangroves is a, is a very good example of a nature-based Solution, not only do they sequester more carbon than land-based forests because you know they have these roots, but they also sequester it for much longer if you don't cut them down, of course. They protect, for example, when we had the tsunami in, in uh, South India uh, in 2004, uh, villages that were protected by mangroves suffered much fewer casualties than there, where there were no mangroves to protect them from the waves. They also, there are about 100, 1,500 species that depend on mangroves. Um, it, it, it gives people food security. You can see that uh, the tribal women uh, from the Irula community over there, they do fishing with their hands, you know, and uh, now they're finding it very difficult because the, the water has got polluted, and they say that the prawns and crabs are not uh, as much, they can't find them anymore, so it's, and they're naturally resi resilient to climate threats because, of course, they are saline tolerant. And they have an amazing root ecosystem. There's probably a lot of bioactive molecules there to be discovered. And they also have traditionally known to have medicinal properties. So we worked in these uh, mangroves, uh, especially on the east coast of India, for a long time trying to conserve them. And the only way to do it um, sustainably is to involve communities and to ensure that communities get something out of it. They should also have a stake. And unless they are getting an economic return, for conserving the mangroves, um, most people won't be motivated to do that because these are all quite poor people. Similarly, we have millets. Now, the millets are good for environment and also good for health. They are they take much less water to grow, so they're very good at growing in dry areas. They they grow faster. They are rain fed. They use minimal amounts of fertilizers and they only need pesticides and can store the seeds. So this picture of this is of a seed bank that's run by women in one of the tribal villages that we work in. And it's just like a bank, and people come in and they can borrow seeds to plant in their fields, and then when they have a good crop, they come back and return double the amount of seeds so that you have enough seeds for the next um, cycle and so on. We also have a huge diversity, and I'm, as I mentioned, um, there are many minor millets that are now going out of, uh, you know, they're just not uh, being cultivated anymore because there is no government policy to, uh, to support the farmers that grow these millets. They have a lot of health benefits. Of course, I think we need more randomized trials to look at things like pre-diabetes, for example, or even diabetes, you know, how much can it help with, uh, for example, replacing rice, particularly uh, polished white rice, you know, with millets. We know that it's very low, uh, it's gluten-free, um, it's got higher protein than rice, uh, and it's also got higher micronutrients. Um, but again, there needs to be government policy you know, to support this. Similarly, there are a lot of what are called NUS, neglected and underutilized species. This picture here is of a, of a root, like a yam. Uh, it's a tuber uh, called Dioscoria, and there are huge varieties of these actually that the tribals in Kerala, um, in the upper northern part of Kerala and Vainad actually, they traditionally used to dig it up from the forest and eat and you know, even cultivate. But these are mostly uh, relevant for local consumption. They are all adapted to the local agroecological niche. They're very resistant to climate change, but they're very poorly studied and represented in ex situ gene banks, for example. And they don't have good seed systems. The agricultural scientists and systems don't work on them, but they've been highly relevant uh, for indigenous people. 
and they probably have a lot of nutritional benefits. So again, uh, indigenous cuisine is slowly being forgotten. And this is again a group of women, uh, tribal women in Tamil Nadu, who are making a porridge with one of the millets called ragi. And they have different preparations that they make for different festivals. So we've been reviving some of these. Uh, and these are uh, women from nine different tribes in Odisha, which is in the eastern part of India. And again, these are the women whom we call the genome saviors, because they have conserved and preserved the plant genetic resources of that region, not only rice and millets, but also they have immense knowledge about the medicinal plants that grow in that region. So we have a regional center there where we uh, also conserve these medicinal plants and, and their traditional knowledge. Of course, the lifestyle of all of these people is changing now with the, with the development, with education, and so on. So I want to move on to, uh, this is, I think, quite obvious mm. to, to everyone, but mm, you know, it does disproportionately impact women, like many shocks um, that we see, uh, particularly when they, women have uh, other uh, issues like poverty, and because of existing roles and responsibilities and cultural norms in society. So UNDP says women and children are 14 times more likely than men to die in a disaster. But then here are all the other ways in which women's lives just gets more difficult. There's crop failure, you know, they've got to feed their families, you know, it's their responsibility. Water scarcity, they have to walk longer to collect water. Conflicts, we know that women are, you know, always very badly impacted and we're seeing what's happening in conflicts around the world. And there's specific violence against women that always happens. Um, there's lack of access to health care because these women then don't have time to look after their own health. They're busy dealing with these other issues and caregiving responsibilities and so on. So right from birth you know, to old age, uh, women's health is impacted by uh, climate change, by rising temperatures, water, air pollution, and natural disasters. Now one of the problems, of course, is that um, you can see the proportion of women who earn, own uh, land, for example, and the, the red dots are the men and the blue dots are the women. Now Cambodia is very, Cambodia, Myanmar uh, are very good because there women and men seem to own uh, or have equal rights over land. But in the other countries, Afghanistan, Nepal, Indonesia, India, very, uh, there's a big discrepancy. And so even though women actually uh, do a lot of the agricultural labor, they are not eligible for loans, you know, they uh, don't have the same access to tools or technologies as men have. So our foundation has always had a very big focus on women and empowering women. And again, these are some data from UN women showing that, you know, the global food system uh, is very gender uh, unequal. And again, uh, children are impacted uh, as well, and, uh, and of course, we've seen children impacted in major disasters, but also by things like air pollution, heat waves, and uh, respiratory infections due to pollution, but also education. You know, schools get flooded. We saw what happened to children during the pandemic. In most developing countries, you know, learning was disrupted for two years, and many of those children did not have access to online platforms. And so they've been permanently affected by that, uh, those two years. Uh, similarly, now there's this uh, psychiatrist that started describing what's called eco-anxiety, where young children, not necessarily those who've suffered themselves, but even those children uh, who are quite well off and uh, are watching things on television and so on, on the news all the time, you know, the bad news about uh, these climate disasters, that's leading to eco-anxiety. Uh, in fact, even during, uh, while I was at the WHO, these surveys on mental health that periodically come out, uh, the very worrying trend, and we attributed it, some of it to COVID, but it's continued beyond COVID, is that the mental health of the young, that's 18 to 24 years age group, is actually you know, not healthy at all. And so they're scoring much lower than, for example, their older, uh, people, whereas 18 to 24 year age group historically had the best, they're the most happy and the most optimistic, that's the happiest age to be because you're looking forward to your entire life. So that age and then old age 
when you're over 70 or 75, then you're also quite relaxed and happy. Um, but the trend has now changed, and 18 to 24 actually has the worst mm. mental health uh, scores on depression and anxiety. And so that, I think, is uh, extremely worrying for the world uh, as a whole. There's another tribal lady from Orissa who's uh, doing, uh, who got the Padmashree Award from the President for Natural Farming. So I think that uh, climate action, like all actions, I think we need women, but in this case also children. And we've seen a lot of young children and young people really come up and become the champions for climate. And in fact, they're making all of us you know, feel very uh, guilty uh, about not doing enough. And I think it's, it's right because they, they say that you know, this generation that has power today is failing them and not really thinking about their future. And if you talk to a lot of school kids, they do have you know, this view. But I think that women are always you know, the first responders in communities. They're the ones who take care of both people at home. But also, if you look at healthcare workers around the world, you know, we know that 70, 80% are women, especially the ones who are like the community health workers and the nurses and so on. So definitely, they will play a very major role in any kind of resilience. Now, at the World Health Assembly, uh, every year they count the number of uh, women leaders of delegations. And it's very sad, the statistic has always been under 20%. Similarly, at COP, they look at women representation in government delegations to the UNFCC. Again, it's, I think, not, not very good. Uh, there are many uh, global tracking systems now, the Global Health 5050, that looks at the heads of health organizations globally. Uh, no, we're very far away from global quality. Um, so empowering women will definitely mean better climate solutions. In fact, there's data that when provided the same access to resources as men, women can increase agricultural yields by 20 to 30 percent. And empowering children obviously enables them to meaningfully participate in just and equitable climate actions, especially since these um, decisions are going to impact them. Now, we've already spoken about this, so I won't dwell on why, uh, but there's more and more data now coming out showing that heat waves, for example, uh, during pregnancy can lead to more preterm delivery as well as eclampsia, etc. Now, we did some analysis just looking at uh, districts in India that have had recurrent droughts over the last 50 years, and we found uh, a correlation between women being underweight, also girl child marriage, because when there's extreme poverty, then one of the things that happens is that girls are married off very young. Teenage pregnancy, of course, follows and intimate partner violence all increase in, in those places where there is a current drought. Now, moving a little bit towards the health and what we're going to do in terms of uh, health care and, and dealing with all these issues, uh, this graph actually shows the health care expenditures percentage of GDP. So again, you know, we have many countries that are only spending 3-4% or less on, uh, of their GDP on health. Of course, some countries are spending a lot and still maybe not getting the same outcomes. Um, but also the share of out-of-pocket expenditure on health care around the world is still quite high. So clearly the solution is universal health coverage and particularly strengthening primary health care, paying attention to the workforce, which is often neglected, especially again the women, they do all of the menial jobs, and when it comes to leadership positions, you know, women are not there in the health system. We have to, like I said earlier, pay more attention to prevention and health promotion, uh, in addition, of course, to managing people who are already sick. Now, cardiovascular disease, for example, this is the leading cause of death, uh, MIs and strokes, uh, globally. But most of them can be prevented if we address the risk factors like diet, air pollution, smoking, and high blood pressure. So this four or five things if it can be done well, you can actually reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease. The local needs of the population will depend on local agroecologies, climate vulnerabilities. So now, for example, in India, we have a climate vulnerability map. And of course, the coastal districts, for example, will be more vulnerable to uh, you know, floods and cyclones and sea level rise, whereas the, the states in the middle might be more prone to heat, drought, etc. Gender sensitive and gender transformational policies are going to be very important. And mental health, not just of the people we serve, but also of the health workforce, because they get stressed, as you know, during COVID, mm. there's a huge amount of burnout 
especially a lot of people just left the nursing and the medical profession. And uh, a word about the healthcare system itself contributing to climate change. And if you add up all the health facilities in the world, then they emit 5% of global greenhouse gases. So they would be like, I think number four or something, if you put the list of countries. So health system as a whole is a contributor, not just because of the infrastructure, the buildings and the electricity, etc., but also the supply chains that are used, the amount of plastic, the amount of you know, mm. uh, disposable things we use, the food, where is it coming from, and all of that. So there are a few hospitals in the US now that are actually looking at sustainability, calculating their own carbon footprint. And maybe that's something that uh, health system should start doing. So at least we're all we're aware. And we can also think about how can we reduce our carbon emissions and contribute and not be a contributor to climate change because we are medical people and so we should be doing more to reduce. So I think in Switzerland, for example, the school children are asked to uh, go do homework and finding the carbon footprint of their family. You know, so they're taking a lot of uh, holidays abroad and things like that. So that brings a lot of awareness, uh, actually, to the parents as well, who may never have thought of, uh, you know, how they're contributing to climate change. But the children actually are the ones who are making them aware. And then it's not, there are no quick fixes and there are no magic bullets. And so we're going to need science, of course, which is going to help us find the solutions. But we are going to need long-term commitments from governments, from donors, from the multilateral banks. Uh, we are going to need governance structures. As I mentioned, it's action has to be taken across multiple sectors, private sector, public sector, but also uh, across all the government's uh, departments. And we're going to need good management and good information systems. So finally, I just want to end positively, not that uh, you know we are all doomed to uh, a terrible fate. Now, this is just a, a graph that shows from the IPCC, you know, what do we need to mitigate? So how the ways in which we're going to reduce our carbon emissions, clean energy, you know, retrofit buildings, decarbonize cement, steel, all of that, increase public transport, so called deforestation, right? Eat more plants, less meat, reduce food loss. So all of this is going to help mitigate, that means reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Very urgently needed, of course, because if we continue to emit the kind of uh, carbon we're doing today, we have very little space uh, left. And we have, you know, by 2030, we were supposed to, I think I have this graph, yes, by 2030, we were supposed to have a 43% reduction. Now we're already in 2023, and we've made like uh, hardly any reduction from 2019, right? So we're still at the same level, I think 1% or something. How are we going to get to the goals that countries agreed to 2030, 2035? And so we, we also have the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, also the same deadline of 2030. And so we've got to bring, as I mentioned earlier, we're all in silos, you know, different, we've got to bring these things together and think about how climate action could actually become the best opportunity to drive forward all the SDGs. And if you look at our progress globally, uh, the green is the indicators that are on track. As you know, we have 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 indicators. And you can see goal number one, reduce poverty. There's no green there, right? Goal number four, which is education, there's no green. Um, and similarly, goal number 13, which is climate action, there's no green. So we're either just making very slow progress or we're stagnant uh, or regressing. And so that's not a good situation to be just seven years away or less than seven years away from uh, 2030. And so we've got to think about actions that we can do that have co benefits, which are unintended positive side effects. Um, synergies, which of course means that two or more actions interact in a way that produces a result greater than the sum of their individual contributions. Or trade-offs. When you do something for development, it has a trade-off on climate, etc. So if we start thinking about this in this way, then we can respond to climate change in a way that you maximize the synergies and you limit the trade-offs. For example, if you replace uh, fossil fuels with clean electricity, uh, low carbon transport, increase cycling and walking, this is going to have uh, reduce all of your non-communicable diseases. It's going to be good for health and it's also going to reduce carbon emission. 
Similarly, if you can plant trees and reduce deforestation, it's going to uh, reduce your urban heat island effect. And of course, we know that it can also prevent pandemics if we stop destroying our forests and you know, uh, making the animals and wild animals, domestic animals and humans coming closer in contact because of that. So similarly, you, know, you, you can look at uh, access to education, sexual and reproductive health services can have a lot of impacts on reducing maternal and child mortality. Plant-rich diets will also help to reduce these NCDs. So these are all examples of, of co-benefits. Similarly, there are uh, technological solutions. And again, yesterday at the Terrasec uh, Life Science Accelerator, I saw a few examples of uh, interventions in agriculture which can reduce uh, the greenhouse gases being produced by rice. For example, I showed you pictures of mangroves restoring degraded lands, uh, improving public transport, decentralized solar. You know, there are lots of new green technologies and of course artificial intelligence. And uh, perhaps in some of the areas shown at the bottom could be where the AI and machine learning applications could accelerate the, the transition. Uh, not just in terms of uh, technologies and data, but also managing complex systems, you know, giving us more insights uh, which, because we, the way that it can look at big data is, is, uh, is gives more insights than a human could look in the same amount of time. Changing behaviors, you know, can we use AI really to nudge people uh, to adopt uh, more climate friendly behaviors, and of course, better analysis uh, and modeling, but also risk assessments and investments. So uh, finally, I'd just like to end with a, with a few slides, which also I want to highlight the need for more research, and particularly for research that is more implementation science and helping to co-develop solutions with the affected uh, communities. So we do need, and there are very few or hardly any long-term multidisciplinary studies that are embedded in communities so that we not only understand the mental and physical health impacts, uh, and each community is, you know, could be a little bit different uh, on health, but also on social structures, on livelihoods, on migration patterns, etc. And of course, then come up with solutions. Like COVID, we have to work on affordable innovation. There was so much innovation that happened during COVID, mm. and we need solutions that are context-relevant, specific, and that can be scaled rapidly. We need to test them out, see if they work, and then get governments to scale them. Of course, One Health surveillance is going to be important and using big data analytics, AI modeling and forecasting. But all of this must lead to action. It shouldn't just be an academic exercise. It must help public health officials uh, you know, respond better. This is again something we saw during COVID. The lack of data in many countries is hindering our response. Uh, and data sharing, I think, for, for COVID was an issue. It's also the same thing for climate. I think we have to not only share data, but we have to share technologies. And I understand that uh, we talked so much about vaccine inequity during the pandemic, um, but there are technologies now for climate which companies uh, have, uh, which are not being shared, uh, perhaps with uh, all those that they should be, because they could have so much public good. And so we need to start thinking about some technologies like vaccines, of course, which are life-saving, but also perhaps for climate that are classified as, as global public goods and where the IP should not be residing with a small group of people, but it should be made uh, available, just like Manting and Best, you know, when they discovered insulin in 1920, 1921, 100 years ago, they sold it to the University of Toronto for one dollar. They didn't patent it because they said insulin is uh, life-saving uh, because, of course, people used to die of diabetes in those days. Uh, and insulin, you could see them dramatically improving. So Banting and Best wanted it to be available to humanity forever, but what happens today is that three big companies control the global market of insulin and make it evergreening the patents, making it more and more unaffordable for common people. So I think there has to be a new way of thinking also about research and where taxpayer money is invested in R&D, or where philanthropic money is invested in R&D. The fruits of that research must be available to the public, because that kind of social impact, uh, I think, is much more important than a short-term economic uh, impact. 
So we need to think about both mitigation and adaptation. The world is only focused on mitigation so far. How do we reduce greenhouse gases? Nobody's thought about talking about adaptation, and people are already suffering and dying. And so we need to spend more money, but also think smart about adaptation. Need an all of society, all of government approach. The government has to be the steward and the advocate and the main funder of climate resilience. We need to think governance structures. Globally, we have, of course, the IPCC, etc. So it's very good that we have this group of scientists, the IPCC, that people can believe that actually put out these IPCC reports, you know, every few years. But we also know that science and scientists are also now under attack. And uh, there's a huge disinformation industry out there. So we have to be very careful also that the climate deniers are not getting the upper hand. If you look at every large so-called development project, just like we do environmental assessment, we need to do health impact assessment. Planning and implementation has to be decentralized because, you know, especially for large countries, the situation is very different in different parts of the country. We're talk hearing a lot about carbon credits. It's going to become like a global trading system. We have to make sure that this, this is not greenwashing, that companies just can't throw some money at it and then say, you know, I've done my bit for uh, global climate change. So it has to actually mean something. So I think we have to watch very carefully these carbon credits, carbon trading, green uh, credits. And it should also benefit the small fishermen, the small farmers, etc., who actually are the ones who are most impacted. So of course, the whole of climate change, as we know, is that it's very inequitable. The people who contributed the least are the ones most impacted. And therefore, we have to bring equity back into our responses. Like we're now talking about the pandemic treaty it has to be based on principles of equity and access for all. I don't know where we're going to go with the pandemic <coughs> treaty. We'll wait and see till the World Health Assembly. Hopefully, it will turn out to be what it's supposed to be, addressing the issues of the last pandemic to prevent that from happening again. But same for climate. And so I'll just leave you with some visuals of our biodiversity park in, uh, again, in Vainad, uh, in Kerala, where we not only conserve and uh, preserve the vanishing plant genetic resources of the Western Ghats, but also the traditional knowledge of the tribes. And uh, in future, we'd definitely like to have a program that establish the clear scientific links between biodiversity and human well-being. So I'd just like to also share some quotations from my father who you know, passed away just a few months ago. And he was ahead of his time. He talked about climate change in the 70s when no one was talking about climate change. And he was an agricultural scientist who was one of the people responsible for the Green Revolution in India and across Asia. But very soon after that, he started warning people that that type of high intensity agriculture would ultimately lead to environmental degradation. But, you know, it continued because obviously the number of people in the world to be fed uh, has continued to increase. But uh, we did talk about women a lot. Uh, and he also talked about if conservation of natural resources goes wrong, nothing else will go, will go right. And again, about collective excellence, not just individuals, but collective work and collective excellence is what leads to revolutionary progress, not just individual uh, brilliance. And finally, this is what Mahatma Gandhi said, that, you know, again, many, many decades ago, that on this world, we have enough for everybody's need, hmm. but not for everybody's need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Swaminathan. Can I invite you to take a seat on stage, please? We will now move on to the Q&A segment to be chaired by Associate Professor Joanne Manskin and Purvis. Now, she is LKC Medicine's co-director of Family Medicine and Primary Care Unit and Primary Care Research Network. Associate Professor Manskin and Purvis, please. And to our guests, if you have a question, just raise your hand and my colleagues will pass you the microphone so you can ask a question to the experts. Over to you, Professor. Uh, well, thanks so much, and a very big thank you for that fantastic talk. I think that you've uh, demonstrated that we've got lots of challenges ahead, but I think that uh, also on an individual and organisational level, lots of reflection, I think, about how we can all contribute to addressing some of these challenges that, that you've brought to us today. So whilst we're getting people to think about their questions, um, we're going to continue to learn from you for a little bit longer in this Q&A session. And so um, 
Your work and your presentation today show this really important interplay between food, climate and health. We're sitting in a medical school um, looking at training for doctors for tomorrow. What advice would you have for doctors and, and maybe how we need to start thinking about a one health approach rather than just our traditional disease-based approach? Yeah, I think that's a great question and it goes back to our training, of course, and when we train as doctors, we stay in the hospital, so we're dealing with uh, mostly sick people who come in and we're not often uh, trained to ask about uh, <coughs> Again, when I was at least when I was trained, I mean there wasn't a lot of social science built into our training, so we're not exploring the family circumstances or. And I, I I realized when I because I worked on TV for a large part of my career, that if you sit in the hospital and you deal with the patient, it's a very different perspective you get when you visit their home because we used to visit their homes quite a lot when they did not come for treatment or they you know something was not okay. And then you realize the circumstances in which those people are living, you know, what the family issues are like, you know, the children may or may not be going to school, etc., because of extreme poverty. Um, and for them, it's a choice between shall I go and earn my day's living or shall I go to the hospital and take my TB drugs. So those gives you insight. So I think for medical scholars, for students, it's important uh, to, to go out in the community and get an idea of how people live and work and the environment. Um, and I think um, for a place like Singapore, probably it would be a good idea for people to go out and you know, have some exposure in other countries so that you get a reality check of how many people are actually living, even in this region. And, um, and then the other thing I think very important is the social science and uh, ethics perspectives that I think we need to include into our uh, curriculum. Okay, so I think people are still thinking of their questions, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, to move on to the next one. Um, you have played some uh, very critical leadership roles, including during the COVID pandemic, and you've talked about the fact that women and children are, you know, impacted disproportionately by some of the issues that you've talked about, poverty, climate change and the like. Um, but you've also highlighted a lack of women in leadership. Um, why do you think the female voice is so important in leadership and how can we promote more women to some of these leadership positions to really be able to some of these challenges? There is a fair amount of data now that if you have a good representation of women on a, uh, in any body, whether it's a corporate board, you know, or whether it's uh, leadership positions in, a, in an organization, you end up making better decisions. Because I think you do get a different perspective and uh, different experiences that women would have compared to men. For example, you know, certain things uh, probably a man uh, would not necessarily immediately think about providing for, you know, a breastfeeding group or uh, some other needs that women may have. Same applies to things like visibility as well. So I think one has to be inclusive. And it's also not just about all women cannot be put into the same bucket either. You know, so women also have different experiences depending on what their other social circumstances are. So ideally you would like uh, to have, uh, and my own experience when I joined the WHO, Dr. Tedros, one of his election promises had been that he would have a gender balanced uh, leadership team. So he actually had this 60-40. And there were women from all over the world. And I really felt that that brought so much of diversity and new ideas and thinking that um, it was a very good uh, experience. So I think there's enough data to show that the organization benefits when you have uh, equal representation of men and women. But of course, women are so far behind that we have to have some catch up, some policies to actually encourage more women to come into leadership positions. At least now there's global tracking and metrics, so we can see how we're doing. So we need male allies, so we men who are in those leadership positions. We have to step aside because you know, there's only one position, right? So I have seen a few cases where a man has actually stepped aside and said, I will have my female body take that role uh, because it won't be fully well qualified and uh, 
So I think that's a very important goal, so having male ally, allies in this. Well, that's an excellent segue. I think um, <laughs> our Dane has the, the first uh, question. Thank you very much, uh, for your excellent lecture. I want to pick up one very important point you mentioned. You say we always talk about mitigation, but very little about adaptation. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? And does that mean you feel that we have already passed the point of no return? There are things that we will have to live with instead of trying to get things better. Yes, unfortunately, I do think we've passed some of those tipping points. We haven't passed all of them. But the 1.5 degrees, you know, we might have already passed. And if 2023 is anything to go by, the number of extreme weather events we've had around the world, uh, I think we have to be prepared for uh, for more of those. Like, you know, we used to say, oh, this kind of flood comes once in a hundred years. Now it comes every five years or three years, you know? So it's no longer rare. And therefore, to say that, okay, it doesn't matter, we do it, it's going to come after a few decades. It's not going to happen. So I think every sector, housing, you know, education, where you place your facilities, the kind of transport, um, how you're going to, uh, and especially for health care, what are the kind of diseases that you're going to start preparing for for the future? What surveillance do you need? What data do you need to collect? And then what changes do you need to make in you know, your physical environment to be able to be resilient? Uh, that's all physical, but there's probably also a lot we still don't understand about interlinkages as well. So, Got oh, just one question here, and then we'll come to you next, if that's okay. So, hi, I'm Joanne. Um, I just wanted to ask, I'm involved in some of the research efforts in the region as well as locally with hospitals about decarbonisation and all that. But one challenge we have is uh, prioritisation. There are many needs, and many. Um, I just wanted your thoughts about, like, you know, in healthcare we think about ISAs and you know the cost factors, and we start with that, and uh, you know, but in the climate space, there is a lot. The, you know, the, that those frameworks are not as well set. So I just wanted to ask whether your thoughts in terms of prioritizing which projects go first. That's the first question. And then the second one is the engagement issue. Uh, we've been able to get people engaged in the hospital with the green efforts, but it rains, it comes up and down, and you know, it's, 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 it's a common problem regionally as well as locally. I just wanted your thoughts on those two. Yeah, so I, I obviously don't have the answer to all of these questions. I raised some of these issues, I think, that we have to grapple with. In terms of uh, hospitals having a policy, you know, one can think about AMR and how we've dealt with AMR, right? We identify somebody who's in charge, uh, usually a nurse who's in charge of the infection control. There's a, pot, there's a committee on infection prevention and control. You track certain data, you know, you make people aware. You take action if somebody's flouting those rules in the hospital, etc. So that could be one way, uh, just an idea of having a committee that actually starts looking at your uh, carbon footprint, for example. Where can we uh, minimize? Where can we reduce? You know, where are where are the actions? And then uh, and then take some collective decisions. Obviously, there you know will be uh, a need to prioritize. Disposables, for example, right, increased a lot during the pandemic. Do we really need to uh, dispose all of those things, or can we go back to uh, sterilizing and using, reusing uh, you know, some things? Then on the prioritization, yes, I think you're very right. We need a system probably for an assessment of costs versus benefits, uh, or, or risks versus benefits. Professor Swaminathan, thank you for the talk. I think on the global heating, there seems to be, I mean, rightfully an emphasis on the carbon footprint. But, uh, you know, if we talk about global heating, uh, my understanding is, you know, carbon dioxide is only like 0.04% of the atmospheric air. But if you look at methane, nitrous, nitrous oxide, it, it, they, there was a way of trying to uh, put a relative uh, heating effect of this greenhouse uh, gas emission. If you put carbon as one, methane is about 27 to 30 times more, but nitrous oxide is 275 times. Uh, I think not much has been talked about. Uh, we talk, we heard about the algae boom 
because of this uh, leaching of the nitrogen fertilizer, which is a major source of this nitrous oxide uh, pollutant. And then diesel uh, engine. You know, initially uh, the UK government particularly was trying to switch to diesel engine because they, they know they can reduce the carbon uh, uh, footprint. But then now they realize that uh, it's actually contributing to the nitrous oxide, which in terms of uh, global warming uh, potential is actually 270 over times even more. So I'm just concerned that, yes, you know, we talk a lot about carbon, decarbonization and all that, but I know now there are some emphasis on methane, uh, particularly methane being a source of ozone, but I think nitrous oxide, in my view, has been really much neglected. What is your comment to this? No, thank you for that comment. I think uh, you make a very good point. And uh, yes, there has been a focus on, I'm not an expert on, on this uh, aspect, and so I may not be able to elaborate very much. But clearly all those sources, like even in air, we know black carbon, but then we also know that there are all these other gases which are impacting health, including ozone. And so I think we do need more work and more research and ways of reducing these others. Methane, yes, this a fair amount of uh, work now, including on how do you get cows to produce less methane and they get just <coughs> food, but also through agriculture. But on the nitrous, uh, I agree. Probably fertilizer overuse is you know, contributed to, to that, so more, moving towards more natural farming would be one solution. Thank you very much for that. Next question. Hello, ma'am. Uh, it's an honor to hear you in person. It was a great lecture. I had uh, 10 questions with me when I came to the lecture, and uh, eight of them has answered. <laughs> Just two of them, I am I'm, I'm lost a bit in between. Uh, first one was, uh, what are the key challenges in implementing adaptive healthcare strategies to address climate change, and how can they be overcome? The second one is, how can individuals contribute to effect, efforts aimed to mitigating the health effects of climate change both on uh, local as well as global. So these are the two questions. Yeah, two good questions. Yeah. Um, let's see if I, we can answer them uh, briefly. Yeah. So I think individual, let's take individual yeah. contributions. Obviously, you can uh, try to reduce your own uh, carbon footprint, hmm. you know, by doing many things like walking and cycling and sort of or taking public transport and sort of taking your car. Mm -hmm. You can turn off the lights and fans, you can minimize water wastage, food wastage, etc. Eat locally, you know, so all of those things are good for your health and good for climate. Okay. Um, in terms of Global. health impacts, I think we have to go back again to preventing uh, disease, you know, and uh, more of uh, health promotion. So during COVID, we found that uh, the people who got severe COVID were those mostly with underlying diseases. Of course, the older mm. people, but then those who had underlying diseases like diabetes or hypertension and things like that. So, countries which had a high prevalence of non communicable diseases, they also had higher mortality even in the younger age groups. So, I think these links you know, between non communicable infectious diseases are some things we may not expect. But again, I think it's uh, on the individual level, each person can make a difference. In fact, I know that a country like Singapore might think we're so small. They're contributing just you know 0 0.00 percent. What difference is it going to make? No, but Singapore is a country that will be impacted a lot, especially with sea level rise. Yeah. And therefore, you have to do everything possible to reduce your emissions, but also to think about resilience and adaptation. So your other question was on. Uh, so uh, the uh, local and well as the global scale, our individual can give. So global is left. left. Uh, what can an individual to, uh, do in order to have a global change? Individually, you answered, like uh, reducing our personal. Uh, so hmm. I think an individual you could become a champion, of course, and an advocate. We've seen many people do that. And they've been affected. But ultimately, you have to mobilize people. Hmm. You know? But we know that one committed and passionate person can change yeah. things. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, it's usually a single individual who ends up changing the status quo. It's a bit of motivation. Uh, oh gosh, we've got lots of questions there. I'm going to go to you next because that's where our next microphone is while the ushers get the microphones to the others. Oh, thank you. Um, yes. I'm over here. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you, uh, Professor Swaminathan, and uh, really interesting lecture. And also, my condolences to the loss of I wanted to um, hear your thoughts on the on pandemics uh, that originate from animal-human transmission. We saw that in SARS. So we lost 99 people here in Singapore. We lost 300 in Hong Kong. Where I'm from uh, the virus jumped from civet cats that were kept for human consumption. Then in COVID, which killed millions, uh, changed our lives irrevocably. And despite all the subterfuge and all the, 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 the ambiguity, it's also probably likely due to animal to human uh, transmission. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on, on what we've learned in terms of animal to human transmission, in terms of animal husbandry, in terms of living in close proximity to animals, uh, reducing our consumption of meat,
uh, hundreds of thousands of self help groups over the last few decades have been developed and we get uh, you know low interest loans and things from the government and we do a lot of livelihood things but they also do things like this so they need the technology somebody has to build them the technology which in this case was the solar reflective white paint on the on the roofs and maybe they which cologne or they got a grant from a philanthropic agency to do that but i think local community action is the most powerful way of changing things yeah, thank you for your uh, uh, great talk, uh, Professor Swan. Uh, so as you know that I jointly appointed by uh, Asian School of the Environment and also LKC School of Medicine. Here. We did a lot of the research looking at internet pollution and health impact. So we focus a lot of like the evidence to demonstrate the impact. So we always uh, have a question. Uh, I think this you are the right person to give us the answer. Well, why is that? How we can uh, better effectively communicate with the policy maker, not necessarily locally, but also internationally, to translate our research findings <coughs> to uh, affect or influence their decision making. So, do you have any advice on this? Yeah, this is of course a, a topic of much interest, and it's something that I as you know, just having the research evidence of the data does not, is not enough to convince policymakers that they must act. It's a political economy that is important. And uh, so this is why uh, it's, it's a difficult, uh, it's, there's no clear scientific answer to that question, that you do these, these things and then you'll have this result. It doesn't work like that. But uh, at the same time, we have to try. And I think, um, one way is, of course, to first generate the data, generate the evidence, and politicians like to see local data. You know, if you tell them this is happening in that country, they say, okay, but how do you know it's happening here? And, you know, they try to postpone taking decisions. So, at least regional data, local data is important. Then you must have a solution. If the solution can be a win-win for the politician, then it makes it much easier for them to implement it. There's a big trade-off and that becomes quite difficult. So this is part of the problem, I think, with air pollution, is that in many countries, there's a huge push to development. More people want energy, more people want, you know, transport. And so, you know, you can't switch immediately to everything clean, and therefore, fossil fuels are continuing to be used, because people without energy, you can't tell them, let's now wait, you wait for 10 years till you get energy. That's not fair either. So there is always a trade-off, and when policymakers make, they're always looking at these. Uh, and as someone said, prioritizing. So you've got $100 to spend, where do you want to put that? And not everybody's going to prioritize the health of the population as coming over everything else. And we know that investing in prevention, for example, is unpopular because you don't see anything. There's nothing in front of your eyes to see. Whereas if you build a big hospital, there is something very obvious for everyone to, to see. So, you know, so this is the reality. So I think that even at the WHO we were, but I think again going back to what we can do as scientists is really communicate the science in a way that people can understand it. Secondly, translate it into an economic case. I think presidents, prime ministers, finance ministers do listen when you have numbers, right? And so if you can translate it into an economic case, then it makes much more sense. And then, of course, work on uh, what are the innovative ways maybe you could finance some of these solutions. So I think we have to not just be doctors, but we have to think way beyond. That's why we need these multidisciplinary groups to come up with some smart uh, solutions to these problems. So more work to be done. Next question, please. Thank you very much. Thanks for a very excellent so my question is actually around the global governance or global governing structure. Because I think in your uh, tenure as the chief scientist at the Rachel, you would be very familiar with this structure. And my question is whether the world is in trouble right now, fundamentally because that the global governing structure is starting to break down. Because in your talk, you highlighted a few issues. You talked about COVID-19 very prominently. And the optimist amongst us could say that COVID-19 was a, a pilot test 
of whether the world is really dealing with a global crisis. And it seems, and the pessimists would say that actually the world failed, the global governing structure actually failed. And if we now look at the pandemic agreement, and there is this difficulty in really trying to achieve a right at consensus in the pandemic agreement before World Health Assembly this May, which is about two months away, that already is another signal that the global governing structure is in trouble. Now, if we look at the, the actions or the lack of action around climate, again, it is pointing to the same issue. So my question, therefore, is do we think that the global governing structure fundamentally needs a reform? I'm actually a strong supporter of the WHO, and I think that the IHR needs to be strengthened to give the WHO more teeth. But equally, we know that there are many countries that are not in, in favor of that. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. No, thank you. And I think you answered the question. <laughs> it is a very difficult, very, very difficult uh, situation where countries just can't seem to agree. Whether it's at the WHO or it's in other UN bodies, there are, you know, the high-income countries versus the low-income countries, those kind of blocks and these arguments which are happening across many. So, of course, for climate, the low-income countries are saying we didn't bring this upon us. We didn't contribute, so you should now fund 